Right. Ah, good. There we go. Right. Okay. And now the microphone's working. Let's take a look. Uh, okay, what are we working on today? Today we are. Uh, okay, I'm digging around with um, some stuff I've been fiddling with for a while now. Uh, I've created a virtual machine uh, to test this stuff out on. And the objective of the exercise is to. Uh, let me just get you over to this piece of paper. So the object of this exercise is uh, I want to be able to take, uh, for example, LaTeX files, uh, mainly for articles, but I've got the idea of articles, uh, blog posts, if you like, uh, and um, uh, uh, some books I'm going to put together. Okay, uh, these will get translated to HTML files, which will then be fed in to Jekyll. Uh, Jekyll will be used to generate uh, a static website. Uh, and that will be published to uh, somewhere on the internet. Uh, so, uh, oh, the other thing uh, is I'm going to take the Jekyll's Minima theme uh, and effectively replace it with one uh, called the Salty Vagrant theme. Uh, and that's going to produce a gem file. And that will be fed into Jekyll as well. Now, what I don't want to do is I don't want to publish this uh, on... Uh, you know, Ruby gems or anything like that. This is just just for my use. Now, why separate the uh, theme like this? Uh, because one of the things you can do is within uh, within your your Jekyll site definition, uh, you can override the theme files anyway. So what I could do is just uh, have all of the files because uh, because you've got uh, if you like the site skeleton. Uh, up here, which will feed into Jekyll. Okay, so what I could do is I could actually use that site uh, skeleton, the, the bit that I'm not constantly adding to, namely the articles and the books, um, which contains all of the CSS and things like that. Uh, so that could all feed into Jekyll, uh, overriding what is in the standard minima theme. Uh, but I don't want to do that for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, I want to keep all of the site customization completely separate. So uh, the only thing which is in uh, uh, this, uh, if you like, the, the dynamic tool chain is uh, the stuff which I'm going to be, uh, the content. Okay, the actual presentation layer, if you like, uh, is all going to be within the theme. Okay, and that keeps you separate. Now, I could just have the theme out as a set of directories and sort of merge these two together, but it, it's neater, I think, to produce the gem because uh, that will contain uh, all of the additional bits and bobs, uh, all of the Ruby gems that I need can be called in by gem definition, this gem spec. Uh, so it just keeps everything nice and neat on the presentation side of things. Uh, the, the only wrinkle, for want of a better way of putting it, is that it adds uh, a couple of decisions to the toolchain decision. So I can either uh, create my own uh, gem server, okay, and then publish this gem to my own gem server, and then have Jekyll uh, just do the installation from this gem server. Uh, that's one way of doing it, so there would be no direct link to the website. The other way of doing it is the way I'm going to do it in, in the, the temporary way, if you like, uh, which is uh, to not have this gem server and to do this direct publish here. So you just copy that gem file effectively into Jekyll uh, at the time you create the static site. Now, uh, making this all possible uh, is uh, Concourse, 
Uh, so we're going to have a series of Docker uh, containers, effectively. Uh, the first one sits here and is for the document processing. The second one sits here and is for the static site generation. So the inputs to this one are the raw articles and the raw book files. Uh, the outputs are this HTML. Uh, which then gets fed in as an input into uh, this Jekyll uh, task, the step in the, in the process. The output from which is the static site itself. Uh, and then here uh, we can have, if we want, the publish step, which does the actual publishing of this static site into whatever, uh, whether it be a cloud server or locally. Or, okay. Uh, so there are, again, with this setup, there are other things to think about, like, for example, how do I manage this all locally while I'm developing it? Uh, and uh, that's going to be slightly different to the way it works when I'm publishing it uh, for real. But, oh, oh uh, it's worth mentioning that there's also uh, a step here to produce the gem file. Uh, uh, which again gets fed as an input into the Jekyll. Okay, so what does that all look like? Well, it kind of sort of, I mean, this is a real dog's breakfast at the moment. Uh, but what we've got here is, uh, you can see I've got the, uh, the, the Jekyll theme being developed in here. Uh, this is for the the tech theme for want of a better description uh we'll cover that in a minute uh this is where the uh, concourse ta task definitions sit at the moment uh this is where the actual website content sits, sits and this is an error <laughs> uh, Uh, let's just remove that. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so let's just have a look at the website. Uh, so this is uh, this has been created as. Uh, uh, sort of nothing uh, very sophisticated. Let me just change this. Uh, where are we? Uh, camera for some reason, these cameras sort of switch around in the definition. Uh, that probably means the browser camera. Well, no, we'll switch that back in a minute. Right. Um, yeah. So. Uh, uh, so this is uh, th this contains some test stuff. Uh, for example, uh, if I look under posts, uh, you can see I've manually uh, this is the original one that comes when you generate the site. This one is one that I've manually copied in. Now uh, these are as ugly as sin uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, so uh, this header information will eventually be auto-generated. Um, this uh, it doesn't look pretty at the moment, but this is what's generated from the uh, LaTeX source file. Okay, when they when they're just output. Um, it's not really a huge problem. Uh, it just needs it just needs a bit of cleanup. That's all. Uh, right. So, um, what else have we changed? Oh, um, yeah. This config file. Uh, you can see here. Uh, apart from the usual changes, um, I've changed the theme to be the salty vagrant theme. Uh, other than that, it's pretty much standard. So instead of being minimal, it's salty vagrant, and the salty vagrant theme. Uh, I've literally just ripped off 
This is just a, a direct copy of the minima theme. In fact, if we look at the remotes here, um, you can see that the upstream is just the minima theme. Uh, and I've just butchered it basically uh, to change it into the salty vagrant theme. For now, it's pretty much the standard theme. So if I go back to um, uh, uh, over here, and that also just to change this camera. Uh, use that. Oh, oh, that was wrong. Uh, there we go. There we go. There you can see my lovely face. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, so this is just the the, the standard minima theme that comes with uh, uh, Jekyll by default, uh, and it's the classic uh, skin. Okay. Uh, and all, all I'm doing is is fucking around with it. So you can see it. This is the test article. So this is generated from a LaTeX document into an HTML document. Uh, I had to make a couple of hand edits, um, but we'll sort those out. Uh, and then it gets published on here as this layout here. Now, uh, there are a few things that need to be tidied up. For example, this abstract needs to be sorted out. Uh, I don't particularly want the numbering, so I'll change that. And, you know, there's stuff about the uh, the text on this website I don't particularly like. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the fonts. Uh, so so there, there, there's a lot of things that we want to screw around with, okay? Um, but it's a good start of a 10. Uh, and all I'm really trying to do at the moment is work through the technicalities of the way it's going to flow through and where I need to do the customizations. Uh, so there are several places. Uh, the first one, obviously, is in here, in this... Uh, theme uh, these theme choices uh, and mostly it will be editing files in uh, this uh, this uh, SAS okay uh, so uh, the minima SAS uh, will be doing some screwing around in here now again you know you can you can mess about with it with custom styles but it's just cleaner I think to start a completely new theme because this will be the Salty Vagrant website theme, uh, and I'm going to have to add all kinds of stuff to deal with uh, the, the, the way you navigate around books and things like that. So it's just cleaner, I think. But converting this into a gem file, uh, you can see here, there's the gem file. Uh, I'll explain the underscore in a minute. Is all done under the auspices of this gem spec. Okay, so. Uh, salty vagrant. Uh, uh, for those of you not familiar, uh, this is all R Ruby World stuff. Um, and uh, I'm not going to lie, uh, it, it's doing my head in places, but basically it's fairly simple. Uh, the gem spec kind of says, this is what I want in this gem, uh, and it just bundles it up into a, a package, uh, basically. Okay, uh, so uh, there's all this stuff which is just metadata, um, which is more relevant really for when you're publishing onto somewhere like Ruby Gems. Um, uh, this tells it which files to load. So you can see it's it's only loading a subset of the files in here. There are files in here for uh, purposes of testing the theme. Okay, so if I go in here. You can see uh, that we've got things. We've got a, we've actually got a, a site which is published. Uh, let's just remove that. Oops. We don't really need that at the moment. Let's just go back to. Oops. Here we go. And you can see we've got things like uh, uh, these need to be put into our pack, as do because they're these layouts and these includes all describe. How the site's going to be structured um but but posts this is just here for the purposes of testing the site okay so if we now go back and look at that gem spec uh, uh, you can see 
we include uh, the assets directory, which contains things like the images. Uh, we include anything with an underscore and that has includes layouts and SAS. So basically that's the two directories I just showed you plus the source CSS sources. Uh, it includes the license and the readme. Mm, again, more useful for when you're on the Ruby, uh, uh, rubygems.org. Uh, I don't really need it. Uh, then it looks for anything that ends with txt md markdown. Uh, so, sorry, uh, I lie. It's looking for license and readme that end with txt uh, md or markdown. Uh, and that's it really. Uh, so in that, that bundles up the additional files. Um, and you'll notice that it's getting them from git. Uh, then uh, the, th this is why it's better to use as a gem uh, because you get in, in addition to that you, you can specify other gems which need to be provided so you can see the, the three here are the Jekyll system itself and then there's a Jekyll feed which produces this uh, this RSS feed uh, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of RSS uh, and also uh, this SEO tag, which if you look at the source of these files, um, if you look at the layout, uh, I believe it's in, uh, I think default layout, uh, no, it's in the, so to do Okay, so you've got this SEO tag here. Uh, oops, uh, this SEO tag. And this SEO tag uh, is... Uh, this SEO tag results in stuff like this. Uh, 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 you know, uh, Yeah, things like this, all this OG, uh, OG local title, uh, description, all that kind of thing, uh, is all produced from that SEO tags, uh, which is useful because um, it, it allows us to, um, uh, it, it augments your searchability. Now, one thing I have already extracted from here is uh, the Google Analytics, which was included by default, because uh, I don't want Google Analytics. Uh, similarly, I'm going to remove Discuss because that's not relevant, uh, but I am going to add back in, ultimately, um, a, a static website comment system uh, rather than Discuss um, in order to keep everything under my control, because I'm a control freak. Uh, and I've got a fundamental dislike of providing anyone with information. That's not really their business. Uh, now, there are other things in here that we don't really need, like this screenshot, for example. Uh, again, if you're going to publish it to Ruby Gems, you would need that code of conduct. Uh, I've actually replaced this. <laughs> their code of conduct just wound me up. I've, gone, I've just said, look, don't be a tool. Don't be a fucking idiot. Uh, in truth, of course, only people inside the salty vagrant inner sanctum will have access to updating this anyway. So, uh, a, a code of conduct is not really necessary uh, because I suppose, it, in theory, it would be employees of salty vagrant. Uh, or maybe I'll open up this sort of thing to special students. We'll see. Uh, yeah, so so that's the salty vagrant. Uh, that's the theme that we're going to be screwing around with in order to do this. Uh, the website's fairly uh, fairly basic. Uh, there's not a huge amount on here. Uh, you've got things like uh, an about page, 
uh, the home page, uh, uh, a description of Salty Vagrant as a concept. Uh, and then we're going to have posts. This is just uh, the um, uh, blog posts, articles I'm going to call them, because I'm not really going to blog as such. I'm just going to put together a load of information. Uh, but it, it fits into a sort of bloggy type structure. Um, and I'm going to be creating a whole section for a series of books that all fit together as part of the training material. Uh, now, ultimately, uh, this is going to produce two two websites. This build chain will produce two websites. One will be the public website where everyone can get access to it. Uh, the other one will be only available to uh, body vagrant subscribers. Uh, and they will have access to a, a different website. I mean, they'll access it the same kind of. I haven't decided yet how to do it, but I'm, I'm considering making it so that when you subscribe, the assumption is that you are wanting to set up, you know, a proper learning environment. And that learning environment will provide you access to all the additional goodies like, you know, like a special GitLab, which will contain all of the extended lessons, uh, a special website like this, which will contain all of the additional information, uh, the full books, that kind of thing. Uh, and if your if your uh, membership lapses, then your environment will stop working. Uh, but it won't be on the internet in quite the same way. It'll be locked down. Uh, and there are a few ways I could do it. One is to make it always accessible through a special virtual machine. So you're, you're actually accessing it uh, via a, a special VPN, which will restrict it. Uh, the other possibility is uh, using things like client certificates. Uh, so you'll access it from the browser. And when you do the subscription, you'll be given a client certificate. Um, only browsers with that class to be able to access it. Uh, the other way is the boring way, is the OAuth path, uh, which basically you log into the website and that makes it all available. I kind of think going the first way will be more in keeping with the philosophy of buying this whole effort. That is, uh, by the time you've done the free lessons, which gets you far enough to hook into the Salty Vagrant uh, lesson plan, uh, by the time you've got that far, uh, you will have a system which would then allow me to provide you uh, uh, access via a different mode. So instead of going to saltyvagrant.com, oh, am I having a dream? Uh, so instead of going to saltyvagrant.com directly, you would actually go to effectively a local host address uh, that would be mapped to a port on a virtual machine that you'd be running. And that would provide you access to uh, all of the goodies. Um, I mean, you still have to have some kind of login, I guess, for recovery of your system uh, so if you recreated your virtual machine i don't know I, I'm, I'm playing around with ideas uh, but it, it uh, the, the, why make it so complicated well there's an economic principle called a barrier to entry where you provide um, a facility for example uh, that but what you do is you make it slightly more difficult than normal people would be willing to invest. Uh, the, and it acts as a sort of filter, so you don't get time wasters and assholes. You, know, you only get people who genuinely want to be involved. Um, to some extent, subscription models already do that. Uh, but by making you first put together the kit, as it were, that allows you that, 
it's, it kind of gives you an extra motivation. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Anyway, uh, back to this website business. Right. So there's that now. Uh, so we've got two parts broadly. Uh, if we now go back up here uh, and we look at um, where did I put them? Uh, yeah, articles. Okay, so we're going to articles. Uh, I'm going to 2020. Uh, th uh, this is just the test system. Now you can see an awful lot of, of crap in here. Everything that begins with test underscore is really just uh, the generated files. The one we're interested in is 2020.tech. Uh, and this is a LaTeX file uh, which lays out uh, the, the basic. Um, the basic documents um <clears throat> is the reason why you like time um yeah so this is just a very simple uh latex file now why latex why not just stick with markdown because everything everything in here can basically be done with markdown uh well, the answer to that is under here. Uh, at least it should be if I come up high enough. All right. Uh, so you can see here, this is a list of the books that are coming along. Um, and under DevOps, uh, this is the beginnings of, again, this is more for testing purposes. Um, this is the beginnings of uh, uh, what will eventually be uh, the book of the course. Okay? Um, and these are going to be more complicated than straightforward articles. Uh, they're going to look, at, they're going to be proper online books that you'll be able to read. Uh, that will also have references to videos uh, so you'll be able to you know, read through the course material uh, and they will also be cross-referenced out so the, the devops book will be cross-referenced out to the specialized books one for git one for latex networking and as i come across a new area that you need to dive into uh, i'll provide um, a book which will contain enough to get you started on each of these subjects and obviously as we get more and more into the course we get to the more and more complicated stuff these books will be extended so uh, the networking book will start out with a very simple description of basically what a network is and how it works like it's which networks work uh, and but but we'll ultimately get things like descriptions of how uh, the linux net filter system all fits together. Uh, similarly, Bash, uh, Bash uh, will be uh, a basic introduction to this is what a Bash file is, blah blah blah, and gradually get more and more sophisticated as we go along. Tying into all of that will be articles, which will and articles will cover uh, little nuggets, interesting bits uh, that don't really fit into a book form per se but might be useful uh, so the books can reference the articles the articles reference the books and well you get the idea so that's what that's all about um so these articles are where i'm at with my testing at the moment uh and both the books and the articles are being built uh by using this fly system uh, now this is uh, sorry fly, fly being the command line interface to uh, the command line interface to um, concourse uh, now what i don't think i've got here, yeah I'm actually i've actually done this Right, uh, so uh, uh, actually, I think this one 
Uh, yeah, so we got this make for HT, which is the uh, this is the make file. Uh, now this make file is written in Lua, uh, I think that's um, uh, which is a scripting language. It's over right. Uh, uh, which is used by make for ht which is itself <laughs> a Lua script uh, that is used to drive the tech for ht and t for ht programs which convert uh, tech into html um, so it, it, it all gets a bit much but all we need to really understand is this is a set of instructions on how to generate files for a static website. Now I say that, but there's actually more to it than that. Uh, because I'm going to have to extend the make for HD system view because uh, it needs to do a little bit more mangling to, to do what I want it to do. Okay, so we're going to have to extend it. So we're going to have to do a bit more Lua scripting. Um, uh, maybe we might change the existing one, but probably not. Uh, so let's just do this. Uh, okay, so to build this, make for ht. Uh, now that make for ht dot, dot make for ht file is picked up by default. So when you run make for ht, it tries. It looks for a dot make ht make for ht file somewhere in your current directory or its parent or its parent and so on um, so we i've put it in here for testing purposes and this is where the test prefix comes from uh, if you look here uh, the, the test prefix is coming from this file pattern here uh, so test prefix so it puts this test prefix and then the input why uh, because one thing it makes it easier to clean up because you can just delete all the tests but the main article remains the same uh, so we can do uh, make for ht and let's just run it on that document. Okay. Now this is bothering me at the moment. It, it does produce the file. Uh, it, what it's telling me is uh, as part of the static site plugin, uh, so you can see here, Okay, there's this uh, there's this filter here, which is taking out the title. Uh, but more importantly, there's this processor here, uh, which is stripping out the. In fact, in fact, come to think of it, I think the problem is that that shouldn't be there uh, because I've got. Um, no, that doesn't make sense, does it? Because without that there, it's not going to produce the static site. Um, hmm. Oh no, that's right. Yeah, I've put this. Yeah, uh, that's that. That is the problem, I think. Uh, uh, and the reason is that uh, this filter is not really required at that point uh, right there you go so yeah so that filter is not required at that point um because uh, down here you can see we enable uh, we enable the entire extension uh, so uh, the extension actually does an injection of that uh, filter. Um, now, I only found that out by actually... Uh, okay, this is getting a bit complicated. But <laughs> just a bit. Uh, so we run HT LaTeX, okay, which generates the... Uh, we, we, run, we run the HT LaTeX here, okay. Now that generates the basic uh, DVI, which is the uh, intermediate step um, for producing the final 
HTML. And it also produces the basic HTML, but doesn't have any cross references or anything like that in, okay? Um, uh, we really need to do a course on LaTeX to understand this fully. But essentially, it's a multi pass process. So the first one takes the tech file and, for our purposes, produces the HTML file, but the rough HTML, if you like, which doesn't have any cross references or indexing or anything sexy like that. Then we run those HTML files through these two filters, okay? And the way the way we know it does that is because of the first parameter HTML dollar, which says anything which ends HTML. And we're going to run two sets of filters over it. The first set is the DOM process. The second set is the ones that are in process. Okay, and those are defined uh, up here. Okay, so we've got the DOM filter up here, uh, uh, and whoops, uh, and okay, so we're defining this. DOM process to be this function here. Uh, uh, and it is two things. One, uh, it runs join colors, which is uh, one of the predefined filters. And then it runs this filter here, which just takes out the make title. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. Maybe. Then down here, okay, this is the standard filters. Now you remember uh, originally I had the static site filter in there. Well, part of the function of the static site filter is to take the head block of the HTML and convert it into YAML, uh, the, the, which is required at the beginning of the static site. <clears throat> so what was happening is that was removing the head effectively uh, and producing the YAML. Then here we were enabled the static site generation, which does some more work. Uh, but one of the things it does is it adds the static site filter on. So it was looking for the head as well. And that was causing it to fail. Right. Then, having done all of that processing, we then run the make HT, HT latex again. And what that does is because we've already produced all the intermediate files, it goes back and back patches things like the, the references. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, if you've referenced, um, it's more relevant when we do the books, if you've referenced a section within the book. Okay. I'm trying to cover a lot here. Uh, I'm probably confusing the hell out of everybody, but anyway, you get the idea. Right. Sorry, am I in your way? Uh, so, um, the bottom line is that what we've got out of all of this is this, uh, uh, this, article here which I believe is also reproduced in there okay so there's the article and there is the CSS for the article although we are going to completely replace the CSS um, if we look at that I mean this would this would produce um, this would produce uh, You know, a whole load of CSS. Um, and what, it, what it's doing is trying to reproduce the look and feel of the PDF document. For the most part, we don't need that. Um, you know, because we're going to take the, the basic structure and apply this style that we've got for the website. Uh, we'll apply that style. Um, maybe. It may turn out that we need to do a bit more than that. Okay, so for an article, that's pretty much it. Uh, if we now look at the uh, look at the HTML, oops. Uh, you can see here we've now got you know, the title. This is the static site metadata block, which is just a YAML block, uh, and this is the basic article. And most of this stuff, uh, the comments are just uh, for the HT latex processor. Really, uh, they just identify where we are in in the in the document um, because it uses uh, it uses this 
uh, to map uh, the CSS in. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, anyway, uh, that was a yes. So, we've now got a, a, basically a document, we've got a whole lot of CSS that we don't really need. Um, but we can we can write a Lua post processor to replace that with the stuff we do need, or we can redefine um, using the salty vagrant uh, uh, tech process. Uh, having a look at. Uh, let's go to. Now then down here, okay, we've got this, this thing here, this style document, and this defines special commands for the style using LaTeX, okay, and when we get into this, we'll have a salty vagrant dot, I think it's a salty, salty vagrant dot 4ht file, which basically is these definitions but in a, an HTML form so it contains things like the CSS definitions that you want if necessary most of this stuff will automatically be translated okay so um, at this point no doubt you are thinking what the fuck uh, but let's go and so we so we uh, basically we've got a document uh, I think for converting entire books into both PDF and HTML we've got to think for converting articles into books uh, into PDFs and HTML and the idea is that when you visit the books um, home page uh, you'll be able to download the entire PDF of the book or you'll be able to browse it online uh, when you visit an article you'll be able to look at the article online but you'll also be able to download the corresponding pdf if you so choose that looks slightly different okay because inherently uh, html is not a pdf file uh, <clears throat> so there'll be slight slight differences in the way for example the, the type is set and things like that uh, but the idea is to get them reasonably close uh, so what else have we got to look at right if we go into the website <coughs> Uh, so, so at this point, we've got. Uh, if I look at um, uh, yeah, if I look at um, doc build, oops. Ah. Right, now look at dot build. And this time, actually, look at it. Uh, God, it's going to be one of those fucking days. Uh, right, um, so this is a task definition for concourse. And all it's really saying, if we ignore this initial bit, is it's saying. Uh, use this Docker image, uh, which I've previously built, uh, and you're going to take this document source with this CI build, with these LaTeX packages, if I did, and you're going to produce the docs output. And to do that, you're going to run this build script uh, within this Docker container. Uh, for the website, it's much the same. Okay, so if we uh, Okay, it is dot dot uh, web CI. Okay, and you can see here we've got a site builder. And if we just cut that out, okay, it's it's a very similar sort of thing. Yeah? We uh, take this predefined image. In this case, we're just using the standard Jekyll image. We're providing three inputs, and we're going to produce a site as an output. And to do so, we're going to run this build. Now, this is a bit, this is a bit Heath Robinson at the moment. Um, 
uh, and it is a bit Eve Robinson because I'm sort of playing around with ideas. Okay. So here's the build script. Uh, again, not rocket science. Uh, this bit here uh, I had to patch in because what I discovered is the container was set to, um, uh, I think it was Canadian. Uh, not sure now, CBT, Central Something Time. Uh, the long and the short of it is I need to change the time zone because it kept telling me that it couldn't produce or wouldn't produce the article uh, for the Jekyll website because it was in the future, you know, just because of the time zones. I thought to myself, bollocks. Uh, so rather than trying to fix the Jekyll image, uh, I've just added these two lines and what this does is it every time you run it it tells the container to just make yourself in the European London time zone which is the time zone I'm in uh, and that, that fixes the problem uh, then I do some jiggery pokery here uh, that was that date was just in there for debugging uh, now this for some reason but I'm not entirely sure why. Um, concourse doesn't bring in gem files. Anything we ending in .gem, it, it seems to ignore when you specify them as inputs. And I just could not get it to recognize it. So as a temporary fix, uh, I rename the gem file with an underscore on it, and then rename and install those. Um, uh, uh, as part of the build process it's a bit of a Heath Robinson hack this whole thing here is going to be replaced with eventually with an access to a local gem repository I'm not too worried about that. Uh, then it just does a standard uh, call to the normal entry point for the Jekyll build why not just run Jekyll directly because this entry point again does some mangling uh, of its own and so rather than deal with the issue of you know when they change the jackal image i have to keep changing my build to compensate for any minor tweaks they they do rather than do that uh, I, I just chain on now, now i could have exec at this point um rather than calling it but i have to know the entry point execs at the end anyway uh, so uh, there's no no real value uh, yeah so yes so that's it really i mean it's not not exactly complicated uh so the fly command is a bit long-winded uh here we go uh you can see we uh, ignoring this first bit because all this is doing is saying okay the thing you logged on to is main i want you to execute the following command okay and these inputs are the maps for these input directories up here okay so we provide one for source which is the website directory uh, we provide the CI scripts which is what produce what what provides um, some of the or potentially provides some of the add-ons as it happens in this particular context I, it's not used so I might re, or I might remove it eventually uh, but in the past it's been useful because uh, for example providing library files uh, the output is going to the dot dot underscore site and site build is just the this file here the configuration file uh, in actual fact there's a missing one here and it is uh, because uh, I've evidently uh, been running some tests there's an input missing yeah? and the input missing is the gems input uh, and that needs to point to um, uh, basically the up one directory into the SV uh, Jekyll theme yeah? uh, we can add that uh, input it's gems equals SV dash Jekyll theme link assuming that I've still got the file in there I'll soon find out because it won't find the gem file 
Right, that looks good. Yeah, it's actually installing that gem file. Yeah, it runs the generate regeneration and voila, I've got my new website. And that's it. <coughs> uh, that, that is the task as it were. Um, now to tie these tasks together, uh, you need to define a, a pipeline. Uh, so the pipeline will say, uh, <coughs> ultimately, uh, go to this Git repository, see if there's a new version uh, of, for example, the articles. Uh, so uh, uh, this Git repository here, uh, uh, so if there's a new version in there, <clears throat> then we'll get those. And these will become the source to a, a document builder which will take the articles and turn them into HTML. And the output of that will become the input on this side, uh, which will then get turned into the website. And the same goes, though, goes for the books. The, the books uh, will get here. So the, the inputs here uh, will be a bit more sophisticated in the end. Not just the source, there'll be inputs for the post, inputs for the book, and the main site. Uh, and they all need to be tied together within uh, within this um, site building task. Okay. So with all that said, uh, one of the things I was going to look at today is um, about uh, input mapping. Yeah, because the structure that we're looking for, uh, he said, okay. Uh, just do it down in this corner. Um, the, the, the structure of the site is that you've got the root of the site, and then you've got a series of sub I mean, you've got uh, your 404 HTML, and then your, your main index. But you've got, for example, underscore post. Uh, or is it a post? Um, it doesn't matter. And this is where the articles will sit. And then under here, uh, we're going to have also an underscore book uh, or books. And under here, we'll have those books I showed you earlier. Uh, again, produced as HTML. So the tricky part is that that means you've got inputs nested within inputs because these, okay, need to map onto the articles input and these need to map onto the books input. But this, the, the skeleton structure needs to map onto the source, you know, the, the basic site skeleton, as you know. So the articles input and the books input are both going to appear underneath it. Now, one way to do that is to always take, you know, to take the articles input because uh, they will appear as separate subdirectories. That's the point. Uh, so if I, uh, oops, uh, if I go. Back to here. Right. So these inputs get mapped to subdirectories, but those subdirectories always appear uh, under a temporary directory, so you're never quite sure where they are in terms of their absolute power. All you know is that when the build job starts, you'll have a subdirectory called source, a subdirectory called CR, a subdirectory called gems. In this case, you'll have uh, a subdirectory. A subdirectory called source, a subdirectory called articles, and subdirectory called books. Uh, what we now need to do is get these all assembled into, if you like, the site skeleton ready for the Jekyll. Uh, and one way to do that would be to copy the source and then copy the articles into post and copy the books input into underscore books. But I think there's a better way of doing it. Uh, but I, I've never tried this. So. If we look under TAF, there is this sexy thing where uh, under, you can see you've got the input, yeah? and that's what we've been dealing with so far. But I think there's a way of mapping. Yeah? Fixing inputs. A job in your part. Oh yeah, that's yeah, taking me. Uh, 
No, I always thought. I thought there was more to it than this. There was a uh, way of actually creating the maps. Oh, there we go. We can actually create it with this directory back. Uh, in fact, this input path could be defined directly as. Let's just try that. Uh, uh, so, what I could try. Um, and the question is how do I go about doing this? I just want to be able to do the test. So, um, I, I manually copied this across last time. Uh, let's just do a quick test. So, if we go to test website, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rip out that posts directory uh, and just put it into my root directory that okay so now i've got posts uh, on my root directory okay now i'm going to change my site definition <coughs> uh, and i don't know how successful this is going to be uh, let's try it What's the worst thing that So what I need to do is go to my web site. I did this site build. Okay, so although the input will be called source, we'll make its path. Now again, it's relative to uh, the same directory. Okay, so we'll call this site. Okay, and we're going to add another path. Okay, all these articles, but its path is going to be site slash post. Uh, that's right, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that should con that should reconstruct the thing. Uh, now we need to change our fly command because we've now got apart from source here, which is going to become our site, we need to also tell it about the articles. So input articles, which is going to be. Let's see what happens. Yeah, it seems to have worked. Let's uh, do fly main intercept. This takes us into the whoops, at least it will if I type it correctly. This takes us into the container that's just run. Uh, so what we're interested in here, okay, is you can see here we've got these subdirectories. Site will contain the, uh, so yeah, so we've got site source. Uh, ah, now that's a bit of a bore, isn't it? Because uh, I've defined site twice. Hmm, that's no good. Yeah, okay, that's my bad. I've actually named the output. Uh, ah, really, uh, wait a minute. Let's try that again. Uh, let's try. Uh, it's no good defining that path to be the same as our bloody output. So let's call it. Uh, oh, let's just call it. Right. Okay, so this will be 
source. Right. Let's try that. Apart from anything else, uh, I think the build file expects you to be in source. Right, that seems more likely, doesn't it? Uh, let's try it again. Now, look at source. There it is. So it's done it. It's plugged it in. Nice. Well, that makes things a lot easier, doesn't it? Okay, so there's the way we do that. Uh, we can just, yeah, we can just do that. Hang on a minute, mate. Right? 